Dr. Ron Rhodes earned both his THM and his THD degrees from uh, Dallas Theological Seminary. And for eight years, he served as the co-host of the, uh, the National Bible Answer Man call-in radio broadcast. He's the author of more than 70 books. I wonder what he's been doing in his spare time. He currently serves as the president of Reasoning from the Scriptures Ministry, a Frisco-based apologetics organization. Ron serves as an adjunct faculty member in our theology department. He's married to his wife, Carrie. They have two grown children. And uh, David, his son, is currently a student at the seminary here. Did he come today? Oh, there he is. Glad to see you here. That's good. Dad's glad to see you here. That's great. Having had a son who graduated from here, it's a special privilege to watch that happen. So uh, would you welcome Dr. Ron Rhodes to our platform? Thank you. Well, now we just got to get the PowerPoint on. We'll see if they can switch it over. You know, one time I was doing a very big conference with about three or 4,000 people there, and right in the middle of my presentation, the whole PowerPoint presentation just went blank. What to do? What to do? So I started to joke around, and I said, come out, unclean spirit. I was just joking. But the whole thing came right back on. It's like, it's like, people out there were going, whoa, that's really cool. <laughs> Better take notes today, okay. <laughs> you know, Russian leader Khrushchev allegedly once said, I don't believe in God and he knows I don't believe in him. <laughs> Not exactly the sharpest knife in the drawer. Now he's from the old school of atheism, but today we're doing battle with the new atheists and these guys, it's like atheism on steroids, it really is. They're very militant, they're very bold, they're enthusiastic. They have a disdain for people of faith, and that's you and me. They even say things like, if you teach your children about God, that's child abuse. Now, who would have ever thought we'd have a day in which people were making those kind of claims? They also teach that the Bible teaches child abuse with the Father sending the Son to die for us and to suffer upon the cross. It's kind of like cosmic child abuse. Belief in God is not only wrong, but it cannot be tolerated. I wish I had a real long time to spend with you this morning. I don't, but if I had the time, I would talk to you just about how intolerant they are, not just in terms of adults, but even our children in public schools today and how they're being marginalized. Uh, I don't have time for that, though. Uh, the new atheists have put Christianity in the crosshairs today. I think we could probably call these guys religion exterminators. Christian targets include Christian holidays and nativity scenes, morality, Christian Bible, the Christian crucifix, Christian influence in school and influence in government and public policy, influence in Hollywood, influence in the media. I mean, it's an all-out attack today. That's one of the reasons why you and I have to be up on this stuff, right? And I personally like to dialogue with these people. Let me just say right up front that I care very much about atheists, and I say that because too often we consider them the enemy camp. They're not enemies. What they believe is wrong, and we need to reach them, but God loves them. And God is not willing that any should perish. Amen? Amen? So let's not back down from them and let's not consider them the enemy. We can reach them and there are atheists becoming Christians every day. Now one of the reasons why it's an appropriate topic today is that there was a new poll conducted just last month. And Barna basically combined atheists and agnostics into one group and called them skeptics. I wish he didn't do that. They're really separate groups. But he combined them both into skeptics and he says that skeptics either do not believe in God or they're not sure that he exists. And he has some very interesting findings. First of all, skeptics represent one-fourth of all unchurched adults. I find that significant. Nearly one-third of skeptics have never attended a Christian church service. Now just think about that for a minute. That means that two-thirds have attended a Christian church service. More on that in just a moment. Two decades ago, 18% of skeptics were under 30. Today, 34% of skeptics are under 30. Our atheists are becoming younger in terms of the demographic. They're certainly more educated today. Two decades ago, just one third of skeptics were college grads. Today, half are college grads. And in fact, probably a lot of them become atheists in college with all the humanism and the naturalism that's being taught. 
Two decades ago, just 16% of skeptics were women. Today, 43% are women. Now, I don't know what accounts for that. I'm still thinking that through, but that's a pretty amazing thing. Uh, they're more racially diverse today. It used to be two decades ago that skeptics were primarily white. But today, skeptics are racially diverse. <coughs> Uh, two decades ago, the skeptic hotbeds were the North, East, and the West. Today, it's across the board in the United States. And so atheism is growing steadily. Now, here's something that's very sobering, and one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you about this today, and that is that churches have done very little to convince skeptics to reevaluate. That's a direct quote from Barna. Churches have done little to convince skeptics to reevaluate. Churches have been relatively impotent in reaching atheists. Hashtag failure to engage. But I think, I think we need to regroup and re-engage. Amen? We really need to. And I'll tell you one of the things that put a spark in, in, in me in terms of reaching these people. Uh, before this, on the screen you see Paul Kurtz, who was a famous humanist, and he wrote a book called Forbidden Fruit. And just listen to his words. The theist world is only a dream world, it is a feeble escape into a future that will never come. Promises of immortal salvation or fear of eternal damnation are both illusory and harmful. They distract humans from present concerns, from self-actualization, and from rectifying social injustices. There is no credible evidence that life survives the death of the body. We continue to exist in our progeny and in the way that our lives have influenced others in our culture. All right, it's pretty, pretty way out there. Now here's the thing. I was way up in Alaska teaching a church about humanism. I had just eaten breakfast in Denny's. It's the northernmost Denny's in the world. That's the sign they have on the wall. Northernmost Denny's in the world. You know, just the previous night, some guy got eaten by a polar bear up there. Boy, I saw that on the news, and I said, boy, I better watch it around here. But anyway, I ate at Denny's, and I went over to the church, and I was talking about Paul Kurtz. And I said, you know, this guy's getting really old. You know, the picture that you see on the screen is decades old. This guy's got to be dying pretty soon. So it's time for him to repent. This guy needs to turn to the Lord pronto, or he's going into eternity without the Lord. Four hours later, I'm at the airport in Alaska, getting ready to get on my plane back to Dallas, and I received a news alert from a religion news service saying, Paul Kurtz has just died, the famous humanist. And it was just the timing. The timing of it, you know, having spoken on this guy that morning and then receiving that announcement, it just kind of renewed my own commitment to wanting to reach these people. And so even today, I'm engaging them not just in person, but even online. Did you know I have a number of Facebook friends who are atheists and agnostics? And they're always posting stuff that's, uh, you know, pretty out there. But we've got to take any means that we can to reach these people. I really believe it. And I really believe that we need a two-fold strategy today. Number one, we need to answer objections that atheists have for Christianity. Now, that's apologetics. And in fact, 95% of all apologetics out there in the world today focuses on answering questions. Now, we should answer questions, but that's not enough. In fact, I'm convinced that a great many apologists out there today have it wrong. They focus only on answers, and that's as far as they go. A biblical apologist is a person who not just has those answers, but he is so sold out and committed to Jesus Christ that Jesus shines through him. And, and people can look at that person and see that something has changed that person's life, that Jesus is real in that, in that person's life. Now, strong answers from that kind of person mean a lot. But strong answers coming from an arrogant apologist with a spiritual chip on his shoulder that he's looking down to, to you instead of engaging with you, that's not going to do anything. And so that's why I bring up number two, openly demonstrate the reality of our relationship with Jesus Christ. That's got to be there in apologetics as well. Now, I think that this is particularly relevant in, in view of what Barna found. Barna said that more than two-thirds of skeptics have attended churches in the past, and that means that their dismissal of God and the Bible and the churches is not theoretical in nature. So they've gone to church and decided it doesn't work. Now, I want to be careful here because a lot of churches are good churches, but the churches these guys have gone to are not good churches. There's a lot of churches out there where the preachers preach a lot of mush in the pulpit. 
It shouldn't be that way. But the reality is a lot of these people have attended church and rejected it. Now here's what Barna found. Despite the fact that people in churches share a common physical space and have common religious views, skeptics have witnessed firsthand that Christians are not personally connected to each other in meaningful ways and life change is not truly taking place. Boy, what an indictment that is. Life change is not truly taking place. So again, I believe that we must answer their objections, but I also believe that we should be committed to Jesus Christ in such a way that life change does take place and it becomes very visible to them. So when I witness to atheists, that's what I do. I try to let Jesus shine while at the same time answering their objectives. Now you know what? 1 Peter 3.15 was right from the very start. If only we had paid attention to 1 Peter 3.15, we wouldn't have a bunch of Christians that were not engaged in life transformation and having strong answers because this verse addresses all of that. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. In other words, we must live Christianly, think Christianly, and act Christianly. Here's how I break it down. We must live Christianly with Christ as the Lord of our hearts. We must think Christianly, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. And then we must act Christianly with gentleness and reverence. 1 Peter 3.15 was right from the very start, and I wish we had paid attention to it. Now what does all this mean? Living Christianly, sanctifying Christ as Lord in our hearts, I believe that that means unreserved submissiveness to Christ our master. He is our sovereign Lord. Christ is not interested in your partial obedience. He wants total obedience. He wants to reign supremely on the throne of your heart. And if you do that, I believe that you'll witness three things. Number one, you'll recognize that when you witness, you are doing so in obedience to him with the Great Commission. Number two, the outcome is in his hands. Christ never called me to convert anybody. I don't have the power to convert anybody. Only God can convert. My only role is to witness, and then I leave the results with him. That takes the burden off of me. I can't convert anybody, but I want to be a faithful witness. And then number three, most important, no fear in the encounter. Now, you know how the, uh, the new atheists are very vitriolic. They're shouting at us today. And I think that the louder they shout, the more some Christians kind of back away in fear. But you don't need to fear because Christ reigns supreme on the throne. He is sovereign. No atheist can do anything to you that is outside of the will of God. So you don't have to worry about it. Fear not, my friends. Number two, we must think Christianly, always being ready to make a defense. Of course, that's from the, uh, the Greek word apologia, which is where we get the word apologetics. And in this context, I think Christianly, thinking Christianly involves thinking apologetically. Uh, apologetics challenges false ideas in our culture when you think about it. Apologetics declares absolute truth in a relativistic world. It proclaims an exclusivistic message in a pluralistic world. Apologetics promotes a supernatural worldview in a naturalistic world. And apologetics defends the Bible in an anti-Bible culture. Do you know what that means? That means that apologetics goes against the grain. It really goes against the grain. Somebody told me, Ron, you had to be insane going into apologetics because you're going against the culture so much. But I'll tell you something, there's nothing I would rather be doing on planet Earth than being involved in the defense of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I've done it my entire life and I've done it with joy. And I'm hoping that some of you uh, get that same kind of bug, that same kind of contagious bug where you're interested in apologetics. I also consider apologetics to be pre-evangelism. We can't effectively evangelize until we pre-evangelize. People often have objections to the faith, and this is especially true of atheists. Before coming to faith, those objections must be answered, and you know as well as I do some of those objections. How do we know Jesus raised from the dead? How do we know that the Bible can be trusted? How do we know that Jesus is the only way of salvation? Or in terms of atheists, 
How can you say there's a good and all-powerful God if evil exists in the world? How can you say that there's a good God in view of the fact that there are moral atrocities committed by Christians throughout church history? How can you say those things? Apologetics seeks to answer all of this. Now, number three, we need to act Christianly. As 1 Peter 3.15 puts it, we give answers with gentleness and reverence. Would it surprise you to learn that this is a theme that is common all throughout the Bible? I've just included a couple of verses here, but Ephesians 4.15 says, speak the truth in love. The Bible tells us not just what to do, but how to do it. Speak the truth in love. 2 Timothy 2.25 tells us that the Lord's servant should be about the business of correcting his opponents with gentleness. Likewise, Galatians 6.1 instructs, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. So we must be loving and gentle and respectful. Now I know what you're thinking. How can you remain respectful when an atheist tells you right in your face that God has committed moral atrocities. You know, our tendency is to get real defensive about things. <laughs> and we get looks on our faces that shouldn't be there. We get defensive when they mock the Bible. And we don't like it when they say things about Jesus Christ that are not true. But what we need to do is to remember 1 Peter 3.15. By the way, you remember that guy? That was a great yeah, show. That was a great show. Okay. Oh, I could reminisce, but I won't. We need to live Christianly, we need to think Christianly, and we need to act Christianly. My friends, it's not just what you say. This is especially important today. It's not just what you say in defending the gospel. It's how you say it. It's how Jesus shines through you. It's how they see that Jesus Christ is active in your life. I can promise you, one of the biggest problems we've got in apologetics today is this missing element. I do apologetic conferences all over the country. You would not believe how much arrogance there is in the apologetics community. I mean, you just wouldn't believe it. We've got so many apologists out there who are speaking down at people instead of lovingly engaging them with the spirit of Christ. We may be winning battles, but we're losing the war. And it shouldn't be that way. 1 Peter 3.15 has given us the answer. So I don't know why more apologists are not paying attention to it. Now, while each of these three points is important, what I want to do right now is to zero in on thinking Christianly as related to just a couple of uh, common objections. Now, Bill is a person I'm acquainted with. That's not his real name. Bill is on my Facebook, and he's one of the, the agnostics and skeptics that, uh, that makes posts on my Facebook that are not too flattering towards Christianity. But I'm lovingly engaging him. I'm following 1 Peter 3.15. And I'm trying to answer his questions. I may not do the greatest job all the time, but I'm really trying to answer all of his questions. And no matter what, I want him to see the love of Jesus. I want that to be just as real as the doctrine that we talk about. So one of his objections was that Christians are hypocrites. Have you ever heard that one? Christians are hypocrites. And so I told him, you know, Bill, I'm glad that you raised that because that firmly proves Christianity. And he says, what? firmly proves Christianity, and of course the point that I'm making is that hypocrisy firmly establishes one of the primary planks of Christianity, which is that you and I are sinners. We are fallen in sin through and through. And it's not just Christians, but people the world over, no matter what their belief system, who are hypocrites and also engage in all kinds of other behaviors that are against God. And in fact, Jesus loves you so much that he came to die for sins like hypocrisy. And do you see what I did? I took what he said and used it as a launch pad to talk about Jesus Christ. And then, of course, I pointed out that not all Christians are hypocrites. A lot of Christians have given up their lives in service of Christ. Many Christians who are missionaries care nothing about money. Many Christians are self-giving. Many Christians do everything they can for the gospel as opposed to material goods and so forth. So I helped him to understand that as well. Then he comes back and he says, I think people invented the idea of God to make themselves feel better. So I said, Bill, just think about that for a minute. Just think about that. Why on earth would people invent a God whose favor cannot be earned by good deeds? Why would anybody in their right mind invent a God who determines that even the most righteous among us deserve punishment? Why would anybody invent a God who will condemn even the most righteous of us who depend only on ourselves for salvation? 
You know, who would invent a God who holds those who come into a relationship with him to an even higher standard? And why would anybody invent a God who will put them through a judgment following the moment of death? Does that sound like a God that humans would invent? And there was silence. Okay. The fact is, I think that if a human being invented a God, they would invent a God kind of like a cosmic Santa Claus, where you know, God will give you anything that you want and who would never condemn you and would let you live as you want, no matter what your moral stance is, you see. That's the kind of God I think that uh, humans would invent. And when you look at the history of paganism, isn't that the kind of God the pagans invented? I mean, there's historical precedent here. Number three, Bill says, I can't wrap my brain around God. The whole idea seems unreasonable. So I said, Bill, Bill, listen to this. I respect reason too. In fact, I think God gave us reason. I think that's part of the image of God in man. God gave us reason as, among a number of other things. God says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. So I like reason. I really do. But let me ask you something, Bill. Which sounds more reasonable to you? The atheist view, no one made something from nothing? Or the theist view, someone made something from nothing? Silence. Again, silence. Have you ever heard of a self-defeating argument? This is something that I always like to share with atheists, and I can promise you this, that in your discussions with atheists, the more adept you become at finding self-defeating statements that they make, the more mileage you're gonna get in terms of your discussions with them. But what is a self-defeating argument? Well, somebody says, I don't exist. That's a self-defeating argument. Somebody else could say, well, then who said that? That's a self-defeating argument. It's a self-defeating argument for someone to say, I can't speak a word of English. You say, well, wasn't that in English? That's a self-defeating argument. Well, when Bill says there are no, no moral absolutes, I respond, are you absolutely sure? When Bill says, I only believe what can be proven with hard evidence, and I'll ask him, well, what hard, hard evidence is there that that policy is the only right one? You see, and I've actually, in my writings, I've cataloged something like 25 or 30 common statements that atheists make and pointed out how they're self-defeating. So this is a great thing to do. Now, what you don't want to do is to make them feel bad or feel small. You need to be magnanimous. You need to help them to save face as you're talking to them. That's part of being loving. So you don't want to do that. And if you can mix in a little humor along the way, that's good too. But you need to show them that Christians are reasonable people. What I always like to ask them is, uh, before you make a final decision, don't you want to consider all the evidence? Don't you want to make an informed decision about God? You see, that always opens the door for me. Even when I think the atheist is trying to close the door, I ask the question, uh, before you make your final decision, don't you want to consider all the evidence? And that can open up the discussion where it'll keep going on for a while. Number four, there is no scientific support that the universe was created. Now at this point, I like to talk about intelligent design. And I must tell you that generally my discussions on this issue take about two hours or so. And I'm just giving you three minutes on it. Okay, so I don't wanna come across as simplistic, but let me just share some of the basic stuff that I might talk about in talking with an atheist. You know, you can detect intelligent design in our travels. The pyramid, the sphinx, the, uh, right there you see me with a mohawk. It, it was an involuntary mohawk, by the way, the wind, was blowing that day, and it blew what little hair I have straight up, you see. So you probably thought I was just trying to look cool in that photograph, when in reality, it was the wind that did it. Anyway, Stonehenge, it's obviously designed. I mean, that's just not like a rain erosion type thing that did that. When you look up in the sky and you see the words drink Coke, I mean, obviously that's not a random cloud formation. You know, there was a sky writer that put those words up there. Uh, when you look at Mount Rushmore, you can tell that that's not rain erosion. Somebody actually designed that. And then, of course, there's the other side there. <laughs> can I show that in seminary? You bet. I might have just got in trouble here at Dallas Seminary. You know, when you look at the sandy beach, you can tell intelligent design from the beachy sand, right? I mean, it's quite obvious that one is designed and the other is not. Uh, when a, a box of alphabet spills over, I mean, you can tell that some things are intelligently designed. Like when mom says, take out the garbage. Signed, mom. And by the way, moms are intelligent. Okay? Do I hear an amen on that? Okay. This is definitely intelligently designed. Go, Texas! All right. 
It's not random. Now, I'm obviously building up to make a point. And I like to share all these kinds of things with the atheist because it does involve some humor and it makes it a little bit lighter. But the truth of the matter is, there's over a hundred anthropic principles that we can bring up that indicate that the earth is custom designed for, for life. It has every evidence of a designer. The size of the moon is perfect for tidal stability on earth. We're the precise right distance from the sun. If we were too close, things would get too hot. If we're too far away, things would get too cold. We just have just enough oxygen on our planet. If we had more oxygen, things would catch on fire too easily. If we didn't have enough oxygen, we couldn't breathe. Jupiter has a very large gravitational pull, pulls a lot of space junk into its gravitational pull and meteors and asteroids, stuff that would otherwise probably strike the Earth. Jupiter's gravitational pull is so strong that it pulls that stuff into its own atmosphere. Uh, the Earth seems to be tailor-made for life. And as astronomer Robert Jastrow put it, if the universe had not been made with the most exacting precision, we could have never come into existence. It is my view that these circumstances indicate the universe was created for man to live in. And so it all comes down to this. All designs imply a designer. There is great design in the universe, therefore there must be a great designer of the universe. Now I know my time is up. I wonder if I could squeeze one more in real quickly. Okay. This is one that is a killer argument. It is a moral atrocity for God to order the destruction of the Canaanites. Have you ever heard that one? Boy, howdy, that's a tough one. It really is. And, and whenever people ask this, I kind of cringe back a little because I know they're pulling out the big guns at this point. This is difficult to do. So I'm just going to give you my take on it. Uh, my take may, may not necessarily be your take, but even if you disagree with my take, at least you'll be thinking about it. You'll think where you, you might agree, where you may disagree. So here's why I come down on that. First of all, I don't know everything I want to know. I don't know everything from the Bible that I want to know. Uh, the book of Job makes it very, very clear that God is not going to tell us everything that we want to know. There will be things that take place on this planet that I have no earthly idea why God did it. That is a fact. That is a clear statement from the book of Job. God also affirmed in Isaiah 55, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. But despite that, I think that we can glean some insights from Scripture. First of all, the Canaanites represent a hot zone of sin. You know, I'm sure you've seen movies like Contagion and Virus and some of those kind of movies that talk about hot zones. These are infectious zones where diseases are running rampant. Well, the Canaanites involve a hot zone of sin. They sacrificed infants and children, not by the dozens, but by the thousands. They practiced sodomy. Uh, men sexually abused the boys. They practiced bestiality with a wide variety of animals. They practiced transvetitism, many abominable customs and detestable things. So it comes down to this, human society, in that part of the world would have been contaminated and endangered to the point of not surviving without the utter removal of the cancerous Canaanites. Women were guilty too. A lot of times people pull back when they hear that women are involved, but when you look at the historical evidence, the women also participated in the violence. In fact, there's historical evidence that some of the women were involved in cutting the heads off of enemies. Can you imagine that, women doing that? They, were, they too were involved in child sacrifices and in bestiality and sexual immorality just as much as the men did. And so their guilt is, is on them as well. Now I use the metaphor of cancer purposefully. My wife Carrie had skin cancer. She's completely cured now, but she had skin cancer on her nose. And the doctor said, this is not something we can give you a pill for. This is not something that we can you know, give you a, a, a skin cream for. You just rub it on and it goes away. We can't do that. What we got to do is excise it. We have to cut it out because if we don't cut it out, it's going to grow to the point that it invades other parts of your body so that the whole body becomes endangered. So my wife was thinking to herself, you mean I got to have part of my nose cut off? She said, well, the doctor says, yeah, you got to do it. Now, thankfully, we got one of the best doctors in the world and he did it and she looks perfectly normal. And I see my PowerPoint went off and came back in. All right, interesting. The fact is, is that without that surgery, my wife might not be here today if we had not excised that cancer decades ago, you see. Now, the same thing is true of the Canaanites. 
They were so cancerous that they had to be excised. God had already destroyed the world once through a flood. He said he's never going to do that again. But God had to protect the rest of civilization, the rest of the societies around that part of the world. And the Canaanites were very much like a cancer. Thing is, though, they had the time to repent. They had the time to repent. There's a biblical principle in Jeremiah 18, verses 7 and 8, that says this. If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down and destroyed, and if that nation I warned repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. An example is Nineveh. I think another example could have been the Canaanites if they had repented. God always shows mercy when there is repentance. But the Canaanites not only did not repent, but they got worse and worse. I like the way that Walter Kaiser put it. Canaan had a final 40-year countdown as they heard of the events in Egypt at the crossing of the Red Sea and what happened to the kings who opposed Israel along the way. Hence, God waited for the cup of iniquity to fill up, and fill up it did, without any signs of change, in spite of the marvelous signs given, so that the nations along with the Pharaoh and the Egyptians might know that he was the Lord. You remember God saying that in Exodus, right? That you may know that I am the Lord and there's no one like me in all the earth. That's one thing that God affirmed over and over again. But they still refused repentance, even after being aware of what God had done previously. They became ever more evil. So God, the divine judge, commanded the destruction of the Canaanites because of their unrepentant sin, because of their relentless pagan idolatry, and because other peoples, including Israel, from whom the divine Messiah was to be born, faced mortal endangerment from the fast-growing cancer of the Canaanites. That's how I answer it. There's more to it. I talk about this more in my, my books that I've written. But the fact is, is that God is a righteous judge. God has committed no atrocities. God is the author of life. God retains the right to remove life when people turn against him. And by the way, it's not just the Canaanites that face judgment. Every human faces judgment at some point whether Christian or non-Christian, you see. Now, Bill is not yet a Christian. I pray that he one day will be. But toward that end, I've resolved that I am going to continue to live Christianly, to think Christianly, and to act Christianly. And the only thing I can say in terms of Bill is sometimes evangelism is more of a process than a single event, especially in terms of relationships that we may have with people who are atheists or agnostics. It may be a process and not an event. And so you need to be patient as you continue to live Christianly, think Christianly, and act Christianly. And as you do that, there's a good chance that you're gonna reach them. I hope that you make this verse a part of your fabric of your life. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Let's pray. Father, I'm thankful that we have the Word of God. I'm thankful that the Word of God is our barometer of truth against which we can test all other truth claims in the world. I pray that you make us effective witnesses, Lord. I thank you that it is not my role to convert, but I want to be a faithful witness. And I want to follow the teachings of Scripture as I continue to be a witness from 1 Peter 3.15. May each one of us become 1 Peter 3.15 kinds of Christians so that we may reach an unbelieving world in an anti-Christian society. We thank you for the opportunity in Jesus' name. Amen.